<clears throat> Posture check, ladies and gentlemen. Hydration check. Take care of yourselves. Okay. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of The Voice of Neuro. Solo round. This time, it's just me. And what am I talking about here? Well, this is a topic that was suggested and voted upon through Patreon. That is patreon.com slash neurozerg, no spaces. And the rework of the Patreon was focused around allowing people to indicate what kind of content they would like to see out of the channel. I am a Zerg GM. I am also a person who tries to entertain, who also tries to educate people about StarCraft, how to do builds, how to micro, how to do Zerg stuff and things like that. But the main edge for me, and the thing that points to why I'm called Neuro, is a focus on mindset and an awareness of the intrinsic factors of our gaming experience. That means the factors of gaming that involve us, the individual, how our brain is working, how our body feels, and trying to work from that point outward toward success and toward improving yourself, traveling on the path of mastery, and things like that, I was very much inspired to take a stab at streaming StarCraft because I saw a lot of people who were not being responsible with the way they were gaming. They were saying that I lose because the game is stacked against me, it's unfair, I don't like this video game, I don't like the way the opponent is playing against me, and they're just trying to point the finger anywhere but themselves. So for me, pushing to GM the very first time was a push with the highest possible emphasis on tilt management. So tilt management is a phrase that is passed around in the poker scene a whole bunch. Tilt is a word from pinball, I believe, which involves tilting the machine to get a certain result. Basically means everything is off. And tilt in the poker context is being emotionally affected to the point that it causes you to play worse. Tilt affects us in every area of life. We are emotional creatures. Even if someone is fairly stoic, they have a good command of themselves, they're not Vulcan. We are all human beings. And just because you might remain poised or do the right thing even if you're grumpy, you're still grumpy. And tilt management is a major factor not just in the results that you get as a player, but also in your enjoyment, fulfillment, and fun. So I wanted to start this discussion on the psychology of gaming with a question that I've gotten quite a few times and many other people have probably either had asked of them or just asked in general, which is, what is the point and the value of gaming? Is it worthwhile to even play video games? I was told a couple of years into my streaming career that I should not be doing this. Why would I be streaming on Twitch playing video games when I have a bachelor's of science in cognitive science and I could work on my master's or PhD and start my own research and get published in a scholarly journal? For the academic track, that would be the way to go. That would be the way to build your legend in that space as fast as possible. But I chose not to do that. And a lot of people were like, what? Why would you do that? That makes no sense. You had such a great start. Why would you throw it away for video games? And being able to define the value of video games, I think, can connect you to a few different things that people already understand as being valuable. One of them is entertainment. So video games are interactive entertainment. It's not passive for a lot of it. You have to click stuff and push buttons to change the situation, to play through the game, and you are a character in the game doing stuff and influencing the outcome of the story. This applies to both single player and multiplayer stuff. And it's entertaining. Being entertained is fun. It also helps us manage our morale, keep our spirits up. If we woke up in the morning and we worked our butt off until we hit the pillow in the evening and went to sleep, life would suck and we would be 
really stressed out, and we would really want a break and have some fun. So I think most people would agree that having some amount of leisure time in 2020 is perfectly reasonable. The amount of leisure time is something that people have to decide for themselves. What is a responsible amount of fun, non-economical time, if you're thinking about paying rent and making money, just fun time that's not earning you money, but is enjoyable and helps you to even out all the different bull crap that you have to put up with in your work life and other things. So video games are entertainment. Entertainment is valuable. Therefore, there is a space for video games if you want to prioritize video games during your leisure time. What is another difference between video games as a leisure activity and watching TV? TV is passive. Most of the time you're not interacting with it in any way. Some writers, directors, actors film things way in advance and the episodes are being pushed out and you can consume those episodes. Maybe you learn stuff, maybe you resonate with some of the characters, maybe you're inspired. That's fine too. Watching TV is fine. All things in moderation between TV and video games. The reason I gravitate more toward games as opposed to TV is because I really like your ability to shape the outcome. I like having some hand in play in what's going on. And just for me personally, I would much rather play through a horror game or something that's kind of a character in a scary situation and be that character who can rise to the occasion and fight through all the evil stuff. That's more fun for me than seeing characters in a movie getting torn to shreds by some angry villain. So overall video games for a lot of people are more fun than passive leisure activities. But then let's zoom in a little bit on the range of video games that are available to us and what the landscape is like and how it's shifted so far. Since I started streaming to now, video games have become way more popular from Zoomers to Millennials and Boomers. A lot of people are playing games. A lot of games are on the phone. I don't do that. If I wanna play a video game, I wanna play a PC game that challenges me, that has the best possible graphics. I try to not be on my phone too much when I'm around other people IRL. I think it's really good to uh, place some high value on the face-to-face -face interaction with other people. Uh, a lot of that gets lost and I think that's a big factor in this loneliness epidemic that we're experiencing is we're missing out on that human connection. So if you're out in the world with your friends at a restaurant, in my opinion, putting the phone away is a really good call. You get a lot of feedback from people that is nonverbal, just in the way that they carry themselves, the way their facial expression is, the way their tone of voice is, and picking up on all of those cues, the ways they're moving their hands, that's important. And that tells you a lot about your friends and your family and helps you to be supportive and the best team member you can possibly be. So given that, manage your gaming time, phone games, if you like it, enjoy that. Be mindful of it. They do have some apps where you can manage the amount of time that you spend in different games or programs on your phone. I would recommend those. I don't use those myself because I basically stopped gaming on my phone after realizing I don't do very well with the Hearthstone in bed situation. <laughs> Sometimes a game is so utterly convenient to play that you could play it in pretty much any context where you have internet. You could play it in a car, you could play it in bed, you could play it just lounging around in your house or walking around, you could play it outside. How much is too much and how do you decide when to stop playing games? Because if you're very comfortable in an activity like playing Hearthstone takes a very, very low amount of energy, it's really easy to just fall into the, well, I'll just do one more round. Just do one more. Eh. For me, I decided it's not worth it. It's not worth the amount that my sleep gets messed up trying to do one more Hearthstone game. I don't like the game that much that I necessarily need this. I would prioritize sleep over having one more Hearthstone Arena match every night. And that was a big plus for me. And I think that process 
of seeing your rhythm, your time and deciding, hey, my time is valuable. My time is also limited. How do I decide what I want to focus on? Is this gaming activity, is this leisure activity worth it for me? Is it fun enough compared to the other things that I could do? And also compared to the self-care things I have to do, like eat food and rest, interact with friends and family, be social and also do work and pay rent to continue doing that. So you are the first and last steward of your time. You as an individual, as an adult, have to decide what are your priorities. We all have 24 hours in a day. Sometimes you're high energy, other times you're low energy. The perception of what 24 hours might be can vary, but it's always gonna be the same amount. The earth rotates around. And I think starting with sleep first might be the best approach in terms of optimizing your effectiveness at everything you do. I talked about this some on the Pylon Show episode that was about health. And one of the things that we all agreed on in a big way was that sleep is probably the best performance enhancing thing that you can do as a gamer. As a gamer who plays competitive games and you care about your results and you also want to be in a good mood and you also need to be able to be resilient against the things that tilt you, the different cheeses, timing attacks, the bad manner, the unfortunate disconnects of your internet going out, the people who are trying to get your attention when you're trying to do other stuff. There's a lot of things that stress you out. And by sleeping, your energy level is higher and you're just able to absorb a lot more of that annoying stuff. And it doesn't cause you to snap quite as fast. So I think about getting a good night's rest as building up almost like a set of armor for yourself and also fueling up your tank at the same time. Well-rested me when I wake up is a lot faster to get out of bed because I have the energy to get up and know what tasks I need to knock out and I'm excited to make some forward progress. And a big part of that and being able to be well-rested is planning ahead of time. So in your evening hours, being aware of the last hour or hour and a half before you're actually trying to fall asleep and what you're doing. A lot of the best guides on getting better sleep involve limiting the light you expose yourself to, uh, not eating right before you sleep, not drinking too much water before you sleep because you don't want to have to get up to go to the bathroom if you can avoid it, stuff like that. And also doing more chill activities in general. Reading a book would probably be preferable to boxing with someone right before bed because one of those gives you a ton of adrenaline and the other one does not. So take care of yourself. Try to stay away from blue light if you can. Whenever I do samurai streams on Tuesdays before bed, I will put my phone in a different room. And that's been one of the best things for me having a great shot at a good samurai day is I don't have that temptation to stay up a little bit later and browse my phone or sometimes you wake up from something random like maybe the light shone through the blinds in a certain way or there's a heckin weed whacker outside the window like waking you up and stuff sometimes that wakes you up and you're like well let me just check discord real fast and then someone sent you a message and then it gets your brain thinking about well what do i think about that how am i going to reply and that takes you way longer to fall back to sleep so get an alarm clock if you want to try this method i would highly recommend it you can have an alarm clock in your room you set that for when you want to wake up you set the phone somewhere else an alarm clock isn't as amusing and engaging as a smartphone so <laughs> you're probably going to get better quality sleep if you do that so starting with health first especially sleep first is super 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 good for improving your overall mindset when it comes to just motivation throughout your day and also the quality of experience that you have within the games that you play. Another thing that we discussed on that health episode was food and diet and how being very aware of the energy load 
that your brain is on your overall system and how you might think of some gaming activities as being more mental than physical, but your brain is a physical organ that requires physical fuel. And if you don't respect that and you don't have the meals that you need to have the nutrients that your body wants and requires, and you're not hydrated, it's going to tank your performance too. So before you even think about doing something competitive or expecting to win a ladder game, you should have some approximate sense of your condition. And this is exactly what I was talking about before, which is the intrinsic factors of gaming. Your condition is kind of the overall mental and physical state of yourself. The way this is broken down in a book by Jared Tendler called The Mental Game of Poker is your A game, your B game, and your C game. He breaks it down where your A game is the top 15% of your performance range. Your B game is your middle 70%, and your C game is your bottom 15%. So it follows that Gaussian distribution kind of curve. Most of the time you're going to be hitting around the middle of your range at your B game. Sometimes you're just that well rested, that well prepared, you're hyped up, you're hopeful, and you kick some ass. That would be your A game. Other days, like my today when I was laddering, are your C game. Maybe you didn't get the sleep that you needed. I got about six hours last night. That's not going to be enough for me to play A game. I need eight hours to play A game for sure, at least, maybe eight and a half. I also did other stuff before. I exercised and I worked on some other tasks. Every time you engage in a task that occupies memory in your brain, that pretty much stays there until you go to sleep. Sleep, in addition to being a time to recharge your batteries, is also a key time when your memory is doing different stuff than when you're awake. When you sleep, a lot of the memories that you had of the current day, some of them get saved into your long-term memory. That's specifically while you rest, when that really gets integrated into your big archives that you have of all the stuff that's happened and what's important. So once again, sleep. If you want to have a good gaming experience, you want to tackle the psychology of gaming, sleep first, and then think about how you're going to spend your time later. I think it's very well known that the people of the world currently don't sleep anywhere close to enough. So please sleep a little bit more. Six hours is not enough. If you can up that by an hour, that's a good start. And then trying to work up from there so that you can have the best possible quality of life that you can. I was talking about the energy requirements of the brain and diet. I can just share basically a, a quick version of what my breakfast routine is like. Basically in the morning, I wake up, get out of bed, put in my contacts, drink some water, get suited up to go for a run if it's a running day. And then I'll have some more water again, and then I'll go exercise, or I'll stay inside and start my breakfast routine. So say I've run or not run, I'll make my coffee and oatmeal, and then I will have my oats first. And I typically will try to do that without doing anything else. Not managing another task at the same time, not multitasking at all, just starting my day clear and fresh, and maybe just opening up the balcony door and looking at the trees outside. And just listening to the sounds I can hear, enjoying the meal that's in front of me, and thinking about what the intention of my day is. Your willpower and the moves that you make as an individual, I think tend to be a lot stronger if you can isolate yourself from all the different things that kind of nag at you throughout the day. Just some time in solitude where you can say, all right, this is my morning. I have the whole day ahead of me. What do I really want to accomplish? How am I feeling right now? What are the pressures acting on me? And what do I want to prioritize with this 24 hour cycle? And in this case, I think it's best to narrow it down to one or two things as a primary emphasis. 
some examples for me with my week would be Tuesdays, my primary goal is to just play StarCraft to the best of my ability as fast as I can, and then learn as much as I can from the losses during the review segment. On Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm trying to be the best streamer that I can, where I'm reading chat, I'm playing games, I'm trying to commentate and be as funny as I possibly can, be thankful for all the support that I'm getting, and really just be with the fam and enjoying the company of the awesome people in this scene and in this community. Thursdays are my variety days where I'm more focused on creative expression and making new content that is outside my main lanes. That includes being Call, the King Koo Bird Barian, in our D&D campaign Wayfarers, or music discussion, focusing on an album, paying attention to the beauty and the nuance and the brutality of some metal albums, doing philosophy, where I'm thinking about some key topic, the breakthroughs of an ancient philosopher, or like this most recent episode, current events. Fridays are my day off. Taking rest and taking days off where you don't have obligations is really important. I know a lot of people experience stress and anxiety if they know there are things they need to do that they're not actively doing, which can kind of ruin rest for them. But rest, like I was saying with sleep, allow you to think about the state of the game for you, what you want to focus on and prioritize, and how you want to improve and move forward, and also just giving your brain a little break. Many of our best creative ideas come in moments where we're not really doing too much else, that's where the whole shower thought thing comes from. When you're in the shower, most times you're isolated from electronics, hopefully. Doesn't mix very well with water. But you can just think about whatever you want. And there's not something in front of you that's like dank memes and demanding your attention and focus. So similarly, a day off and some time away are really, really good for being able to plan your next moves and just daydream and think about whatever. And then for Saturday, my primary focus is being the best main tank and guild leader that I can for the first half of stream. I main tank for creation. I've never missed a Saturday raid, and that was one of the main reasons why I wanted to main tank. It's a 40 person raid endeavor, which is a huge, huge social undertaking. You have to share a voice channel with all those people at once. People need to be respecting that space knowing when to speak and when to not so that everyone can work together and down the content. And the real challenge of that game is the management of that size of a social group, more so than the mechanics of the content. No question, StarCraft is way more mechanically intensive than Classic WoW. Dota 2 is way more mechanically intensive than Classic WoW. But socially speaking, your interactions and your reputation with other real human beings in the world and your ability to make compromises with them, plan and organize with them, and advance and improve with that large group of people is ridiculously complex and interesting and honestly amazing. The thing that really surprised me with Classic WoW, being a main tank and being a guild leader is how many real world skills are involved in those roles. Being a good communicator, being able to talk to someone even when the topic isn't fun. As a streamer, the viewers aren't quite as invested in the stream the same way that a raider is invested in the raid because the raider has their character there and the growth of their character is very much determined by the decisions of the group to decide, are we gonna give you this fancy sword or not? And with that at stake, tensions are pretty high and people care a lot. So you wanna make those decisions carefully and be the best kind of leader that you can. Honestly, it's been pretty difficult. It's way harder than I expected, but that fits perfectly within my personality type. My personality type is that of an optimist where it's like, oh yeah, we can totally do that. It's gonna be great and it's gonna be fun and we're gonna rock it. A lot of the time that's true. And having that can-do attitude helps me to take some risks that I might not otherwise if I was overly cautious or scared that things could go wrong. 
it moves us forward. Maybe you make a mistake, maybe you need some adjustments to be made, but it does keep the ship moving in a forward direction. Another thing that I've learned from being a part of a guild is when you have 40 to 50 people working on a team, you have a bunch of different personality types and humans as a group can achieve way more than they can as individuals. So things like being a huge optimist can be balanced out by people who are more cautious and who are more worried about things that could fail moving forward. And when you add up all those voices and you allow them to communicate freely amongst each other and they really bridge the gaps and find common ground and agree on things, the overall fate of the guild is much improved. So I'm trying to balance my vision for what I think this guild should be with the real people who are in this guild and what they want out of it so that we can all find the best possible experience together moving forward. So yeah, big undertaking, much bigger than I thought it was. I've learned a whole bunch of lessons really fast. It's been a crash course in leadership for me. And overall, it's been going well. We've improved a whole bunch since the start of Classic WoW, and I'm still loving it. It's not as engaging of content for me when I'm focusing on being the main tank that I can. I try to respect the raid and the team whenever that phase of the stream is active. Instead of reading the chat as much as I can or saying the thank you, thank you right away when things happen, I'm trying to listen to the calls of the raid leader, the calls of the off tank, have the boss in the right position, do my job as perfectly as I can so that everyone else has a really good time and we down the raid as fast as possible. So that would be my priority for Saturday. And then we have an officer meeting after the raid. I take as much time as is necessary for that. I wanna be there and lead from the front with creation. I wanna be the kind of leader who isn't the streamer who gets carried like on a very nice, uh, what do you call those things where you have like a bunch of sticks out and you have servants carrying you around like you're some kind of royalty. Streamers have that kind of reputation in WoW a lot where people give them as much gold as they want. They do whatever that person needs. They go way out of their way to help them and the streamer can just kind of feed off of all of that energy. So to contrast that, I wanted to have the highest possible raid attendance, which I have, and then also really being there for all those leadership conversations that we have. So I'm present in all those discussions. And then after the officers meeting, we do what? Subscriber casting and analysis. That is a part of gaming that isn't for me primarily. It's for the regulars and the supporters. I want people to feel awesome about the matches they've played because really that is one of the best things about StarCraft 2 or StarCraft 1, but I focus on StarCraft 2. You get your own personal journey. You get an individual quest starting from bronze or wherever you began up to wherever you are that was not influenced by a committee. A bunch of people didn't decide, okay, you're gonna start off with six workers this time. You're gonna start off with 20 workers this time. Everyone starts with 12 workers, a town hall, and a, what, an overlord if you're Zerg. Overlords are awesome, by the way. But on Saturday, you get to have your stories told and you get to feel like a badass, or you get to get some coaching and some help. It's one of those areas where I'm not doing the kind of content that's going to be the most successful for your average Twitch viewer. Your average Twitch viewer in StarCraft wants to see ladder games with commentary. That's it. They want to see you spam that all day long. Subscriber casting and analysis. The streamer isn't playing GM games and explaining how that works. The streamer is shout casting maybe a gold game. And in that gold game, the players are making a lot more mistakes than would happen in GM, but it's fun. And it's where someone is in their development as a player. And I was there once. I used to be in gold. And I think it's really rich and fun to get those kind of snapshots of where they are. 
How are their fundamentals? How many workers did they make? What are the main mistakes they made? Did they make some cool moves? It's all really interesting and every single person's journey is unique. A lot of people will see the casting and they'll try to assess how good is this player? Am I better than this player? People do that all the time and it's a little bit exhausting. If you want to have a really smooth and streamlined perception of your skill and the skill of other people in the scene, being aware that no two people have the exact same amount of experience in the game is a really good starting point. So when you're assessing, am I better or is that person better? Well, it would be relative to the number of games you've each put in, and it would be relative to the prior gaming experience that you had in similar categories, and it would be relative to the amount of coaching you may have gotten from people, and the number of times you've studied builds and had some strictness with your practice. And if you add up all of these factors, it's so unique that why would you even make a comparison in the first place? It is your own personal journey. And any time that you spend assessing, am I better or worse than this person next to me? You could have spent that on, what do I need to work on to improve? And the main thing there that is a very powerful edge is taking responsibility for every loss. If you can lose a match and immediately go toward the question of, what was my first major mistake? That is one of the strongest approaches you can have to your learning process. A lot of times people will lose a match and they'll think about the last fight that happened. And they'll notice the units the opponent made in that fight. And many of them will say, that unit is overpowered. Storms are just way too strong against Zerg. Battlecruisers are way too strong against Zerg. Lurkers with spores and ZVZ. You can't do anything about that. This is bullshit. And then you kind of move on to the next match and you write it off as a loss that was not your responsibility. It was the StarCraft II balanced design team's responsibility. And if they would have done a better job, you would have won. If this sounds silly and absurd to you, that's because it's very silly, but many people think like this all the time. So responsibility, you earn your losses with your mistakes. Basically the loss is a collection of the mistakes that you made that your opponent capitalized on for some advantages. It doesn't mean that your opponent played well per se, or in a way that you would say was impressive or in a way that would win a GSL Codes. But still, it was good enough to take the advantages from you and ultimately the match. So instead of saying, well, that's bullshit, you could say, why? Why did that happen? Where and when did I make my first main mistake? And then you get your pencil or your pen and you take that to the paper and you write it the fuck down. You write down those mistakes. If you really want to figure out what's going on and why you're not better than you are, you should be able to find some clear and tangible mistakes. It's really not that advanced or complicated to see that you were supply blocked at 36 out of 36 for two minutes because you forgot to build an overlord and then the Terran killed an overlord and then you sent in an overlord to scout and they also killed that one and you still forgot to build overlords and you're supply blocked for two minutes. And then the battle cruiser comes in and then you throw your hands in there and say, this is a bullshit unit. I can't believe the queen nerf when really you fucked up in four different ways before the battle cruiser even arrived. That's what you should be focusing on. You should be focusing on what you are doing and what is in your sphere of control. Not my fault syndrome is very widespread in Starcraft and outside of Starcraft. So basically, psychology of gaming, you're looking at tilt management, a physical and mental awareness of yourself and your condition as you're entering into the game, taking as good a care of yourself as you can. You're also looking at being responsible with that time, your priorities for how you're spending your gaming time and what you're focusing on within that game. 
you're also building your legend to the point of the casting and the analysis. It's cool to achieve something. And one of the number one top amazing, awesome things about gaming is being able to prove to yourself that you can achieve a goal that you set. How massive is that? So many people in the world, I think, take stabs at each other. They criticize other people's accomplishments and achievements because they don't feel confident and proud of themselves. I'm not talking hubris where you're so proud that you're obnoxious and you failed to see your shortcomings. I'm talking about being at ease, being at peace with yourself and being steady and being cool and saying, I've done some pretty cool stuff that I'm proud of. So when someone else is talking about their accomplishment, I can simply clap for them and I can be proud of them too. I don't need to say, oh, well, you did that. Well, I did this and that's even better. Or, oh, you did that. Well, let me point out three things about that that were not correct. That's obnoxious. But a lot of people do that because they don't really feel that sense of satisfaction of, I played the hardest 1v1 game that's around StarCraft 2 or StarCraft 1, whatever. And I got Diamond League. And that's one of the higher percentile leagues to be in. That's pretty tough. You have to have a decent bit of game knowledge. You have to be able to use your keyboard and mouse pretty fast. That's an achievement right there. A lot of people play StarCraft and getting Diamond League is pretty hard. It's a very, 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 very competitive scene. So for you to go into a hyper competitive scene and move up and get into one of the upper tiers, that's something that is with you for the rest of your goddamn life. How cool is that? I think that's amazing. And I think you can kind of see it in people that you talk to. A lot of people are really steady because they know the obstacles they've overcome. They know their achievements. They don't need to tell you all of their achievements because they already feel pretty chill about it. The people who are really aggressive and obnoxious are the ones who don't feel like they've done anything of value. And they're trying to find ways to pull other people down to their level instead of Climb the fucking mountain yourself. The mountain is there. The ladder is available. You can queue onto it at any time. You could analyze a replay at any time. You could play Dota 2 and learn a hero at any time. You could write your first book or your second book at any time. You could get off the couch and run a 5K at any time. That is all available to you. So when you're thinking about your gaming or other people's gaming, you should be thinking about what activities represent some kind of forward progress. Criticizing other people, if it's constructive, that is forward progress. If you see someone else's game and you feel like they made a major mistake and they don't know it, here's a quick tip. Ask them if they're open to some feedback. Holy crap. That is a very major difference in how a comment is received. If you just ask first, yo, is it cool if I give you some feedback on that replay? Most people would say yes, because you were polite and you decided to check with them first to see if they want some backseat gaming. If they say yes, then go ahead. If they say no, then don't. But if you just open with a comment, especially if it's poorly delivered, like, man, I can't believe this guy has absolutely no micro against storms. That's just punching at somebody. While you did point out something that maybe could be interpreted as valuable, such as pre-split your units before you engage an army with storms. You just took a stab and called them bad, basically. So that was not a very good move. Maybe they can figure it out eventually, but a lot of people, they withdraw and they kind of close themselves off if they realize someone is going to hassle them. So be kind, be compassionate, and also recognize that losing is frustrating for other people as much as it is for yourself, sometimes even more. So you should have that kindness and compassion whenever you're giving some constructive criticism. Is this helpful to the other person? Is this delivered in a good way? I've used the analogy of football and tackling where sometimes your job is to tackle a problem and you can tackle someone, but sometimes the form of that tackle was really bad 
and that can cause you and the other person to be injured. So not only do you want to <clears throat> tackle the items in front of you, you want to do so in a way that is efficient for you and your energy and is nice for the other person too, if you can manage it. Watch your form. Be aware of the social dynamics and the elements. Even if StarCraft is a 1v1 game, even if chess is a 1v1 game, being able to make friends in the scene increases your potential for success because you have teachers who you can learn from and peers who you can practice with and students who you can teach. And in all three of those cases, there are ways that you can learn more about the game. And that's awesome. It sounds a lot like the right speech in Buddhism. That is exactly what it is. This plays into sportsmanship, says chat. At GM levels, it's important to acknowledge the effort put forth by your opponent. Yes, and that was one of the most shocking things for me when I went from playing American football growing up and having coaches who emphasized things like building character through the sport and respecting the other team. And that was really drilled into me in football practice by the coaches. If one of the players would disrespect another player or disrespect a teacher or something like that, the coach would chew him out and say, that is unacceptable. You are being disrespectful. We are here to play football. But before that, we are here to be gentlemen and good people and to build character through this process. And then I go and I open up Justin TV and you see people who are playing StarCraft and being like, fuck this guy, he's terrible. This guy's awful, he's just bad. And that's par for the course. <laughs> More people I think who were streaming on Twitch had that toxic attitude of, oh, he's just bad, this guy's terrible. That was their way of thinking about the games and talking about their opponents rather than respecting their opponents as competitors who through cunning or mechanics could take the victory from you. So you should be aware of that. Esports is very, very young. We don't have the same decades and centuries of examples to follow. And that was a big part of being neuro was bringing out the old books that I have. Sun Tzu Art of War. It has a bunch of basic advice for military command that applies directly to StarCraft. Don't attack uphill. If an opponent is focusing everything they have on defense, attacking into them is probably a bad idea. You should probably expand instead. Stuff like that, where people make these basic Sun Tzu mistakes, where a book that was written thousands of years ago said don't do that, and then someone in the game does that, and then they balance wine, is comical at best. <laughs> Another book that I reference a lot is Bruce Lee's Striking Thoughts. This one is very philosophical in nature. It's not as much a guide of military command. It's more about how to focus your mind, your will, your thoughts, thinking about ideas and purpose. He mixes in some Buddhism, Taoism, things like that to it. But he was one of the best fighters who was also able to articulate how fighting works and how to find your own way forward. Instead of just copy pasting someone else's fighting style, Bruce Lee talked about having no style as style, where you don't need to go through a book and copy certain poses and moves and train those. You can think about how your body is moving and how to achieve the blows that you're trying to, to beat your opponent in a fight. So Bruce Lee's Striking Thoughts is one that has a bunch of wisdom I would highly recommend. And the third one was Miyamoto Musashi's Book of Five Rings. He's the best known samurai of all time. Probably the best samurai duelist who existed. Also another person like Bruce Lee who liked words, liked writing, liked thinking about stuff and touching upon all the arts. Book of Five Rings talks about rhythm and the rhythm of fighting in a way that reminds me a lot of the different timers that we have to remember and manage in StarCraft. Things like the timing of an inject, when you apply it and when it's done, the timing of a mule, when you drop it on the minerals, 
and how long that's going to be mining, the timing of a chrono boost from a Protoss Nexus onto a structure, and memorizing all those different things and trying to keep track of them. It's fairly similar to what Miyamoto Musashi is talking about with the timing of different swings of the sword, the different stages of life that you go through, serving a master, leaving their service, going through a fight, things like that, the rising of the sun. And it's really beautiful and I think really helpful for having a level of strictness and discipline with your approach to gaming. Just referencing the old greats, the people who reached a very, very high excellence level in their craft and were also able to explain that process and where they got to. And trying to bring that to esports, trying to just have a voice of accountability, responsibility, and focus on the task at hand and making the most of your time. 2020 for a lot of people, this year's pretty messed up, so it's kind of hard to use 2020 as an example of the modern era. But relatively speaking, a lot of people take their survival for granted. We basically assume most times that we're going to live through the day to the next day and through the next years, and we can very often lose that sense of our own mortality and that we're running up against the clock here. I'm not trying to rush people, but many times people act in ways as though they're going to live forever, so it doesn't matter. You can just make that rude remark to someone else because eh, they'll get over it and I'm going to have other opportunities to make friends. When people who have known others who have passed away at a young age have a very keen sense of how soon things could go bad and how your future opportunities are not guaranteed. And that makes being mean and toxic seem like a really stupid idea. If in the case that you don't have tomorrow and you only have today, and the last thing that you said to someone was that they're trash at the game, that's a really sour note to end on. So having that awareness of what is the kind of person you want to be and how can you pursue greater consistency on that path? Are you trying to be a righteous and upstanding person? If so, every interaction counts. If that seems like a daunting task, that's because it is. What is the biggest burden holding people back on reaching their highest potential? Ask the chat. That's tough. Uh, the theme for this discussion so far has been time. I think being able to surpass other people in skill or reach your full potential requires an immense amount of time. Reaching your full potential in something also means that you abstain from doing other stuff. You focus your time and you basically pour all of your effort and energy into that main task. And this... I think an example of this would be the difference between a StarCraft streamer and someone who is a pro gamer and how those are different trades. Both of them involve playing the game StarCraft, but one of them is focused on maximizing their potential skill when they're at an offline event. And the other one is about engaging and interacting with an audience while also playing the game. So potential kind of depends on how you define it. What is the highest potential that you are trying to achieve? Are you trying to achieve the highest MMR that you can? Because if I wanted to push for my highest MMR, I want to remove as many distractions as possible, such as streaming. So I could just not stream for a month, but I need to stream to make money and pay rent. So I have to stream, but good news. I love streaming. I really like streaming StarCraft. Just for a general note about Burnout, I fucking love this game. There was a patch with Zerg nerfs and new maps, and I think some of them are kind of bad for Zerg, but the game is in a really interesting and cool spot. I feel like I earn all my losses still, which is good. It doesn't feel like Zerg can't do anything. I go over the replay and I see a bunch of mistakes that I made, so that's a, a really good sense to have with the matches, even if you're not at your peak for MMR. 
Samurai streams have been my compromise for this point where I would like to give myself an opportunity to play my very best. So I will mute all my alerts, mute my microphone, hide the chat, and just focus purely on playing my best. It's not as high impact overall as if I just turned the stream off for a week and I practiced every day, but it's still really hype. And I think it allows me to play at a faster level than I could with all the other bells and whistles of streaming and stuff. Chat asks, can I share a moment when I was legitimately tilted or feeling upset towards the game slash player in the recent past? Yes, actually. I've noticed for myself, if I feel tilted toward a particular opponent, say there's an opponent who I'm faced with who I think has done some bad stuff. I feel like that person is morally in the wrong for things outside of the StarCraft match itself. Sometimes that puts me in a judgmental mindset where I'm thinking, oh, this is, uh, this is bad. I need to like win for the cause of righteousness in the world in general. And I've noticed about myself that I tend to play worse when I add that pressure to myself to not only win the game, but also champion a moral cause at the same time. It's just too much of a mental load. It's better if I just get into the match and I say, okay, this is an opponent. I think this is what their style is. I think I know a game plan that I could go for that does pretty well against that style. And I'm just going to treat it as a whatever the matchup is and play it out and not really care too much about that. Discussions about the qualities of a person or their actions outside the game, that can happen at a later time. Just being able to drill in that focus. So for me, I would say that being very slightly tilted is good because it can kind of jolt me into action. Sometimes I fire up StarCraft and I'm in a very comfy and cozy mood where I'm not really in the mindset to get ready to be harassed by Reapers and get proxied by Barracks and 12 pulled and Zealots in my base and cannon rushes. And then you hit the ladder and it's like, cheese, 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 cheese. And it, that's pretty rustling. But after a few of those losses, you can kind of almost wake up a little bit and be like, okay, these are people where, who are really trying to annoy me and kill all of my stuff. Like you have to be sharp. You have to be aware. You have to be fast moving. Keep your head on a swivel. Don't tunnel vision. Like play as fast as you possibly can. Being slightly tilted is good for that. You just get a little bit of a kind of thorn in your side of, ah, I need to be more alert than I am. So tilt, I would say, isn't totally bad. A little bit of emotional activation, a little bit of frustration, a little bit of stress can help your body realize this is important to me and I wanna be doing better than this. So I'm not trying to say that you should not be frustrated or you should not get mad at yourself. Sometimes being a little bit frustrated with yourself says we can be at a higher level than this. I don't know what the problem is but I really care and I wanna find out. So you can direct that tilt, you can direct that frustration into the replay section, crack open the game and really try to figure out what went on. So you put on the thinking cap of the investigator where you're trying to solve the mystery of why you lost rather than what a lot of people do, which is they put their whole ego on the line for every single match. And if they lost the match, they need to explain to the other person why it wasn't a legitimate loss and that they still were the better player all along. It's silly, but it happens a lot. Another question about the psychology of gaming is how to overcome ladder anxiety. The main thing that I did when I was trying to go from masters to GM was just set a season ladder matches played goal. Instead of saying, I want to go from being a diamond player to a master's player or a master's player to a GM, I would just start the season and be like, okay, I am in master's. If I want to be in GM, I should be playing at the very least as much as other master's players, if not more. So how about a thousand games a season? A thousand games, that's like putting in reps. It's like putting in laps of swimming or running. 
It's the distance that you have to cover to learn the lessons of the game. If you're anxious about laddering, that means that you're looking at your rank and you're scared of it going down. But your rank is just the average of your past. That's it. It's not indicative of how your next match is going to go necessarily. You could get a really strong opponent. You could get a really weak opponent relative to you. You could play the best game of your career. Or you could play a pretty crappy game. You don't know until you try. And if you want to move up, you have to put in laps. It's kind of like asking the same thing of how do I lift more weights, but you don't want to try to max out because you're afraid that, well, it might not be as good as the last one. You've just got to keep at it. And I think identifying an issue like that, like ladder anxiety, is an opportunity to build some character and some force of will in yourself as a human being that you can take outside of StarCraft. I am anxious about laddering. Okay, you're experiencing anxiety that is related to loss aversion. This can happen in a lot of other capacities too, not just StarCraft. So what can you do to fire yourself up and get yourself into a fighting mood where you're ready to kick some ass and try, even if it sucks? An example for me is Brunt Halfatone Mistrunner, Torn Warrior of the Mistrunner tribe. My WoW character is kind of the avatar of all the manliness, bravado, massiveness, and confidence of being in the front, being a beast, standing up against whatever is there, and trying his best to protect his friends. That's a lot of aspects of what I represent as a person, but it's like a concentrated form. And I have some other cues that I have connected with this, like All Might's theme from My Hero Academia. All Might is the strongest hero who ever lived, basically. He's a total badass, but he has some weaknesses to him as well. He feels pain and his power is limited. He can't be fighting all the time. And that character as well gives me a lot of inspiration that says, it's okay to be vulnerable. You can still be strong. It's okay to be scared. Sometimes just standing up tall, even if you don't feel great, is a good move. So for me, it's also about trying to figure out what gets you in the right mental state to be confident and to take the risk and to try to kick some ass. What about a one more game mentality? Is that good or bad? I think that can be fine as long as you're not butting into the time that you would need to dedicate to other stuff. There is the risk seeking aspect of that where sometimes if you're on a downswing you rage queue into another game a lot of people do this i have also done this you feel like you were very unsatisfied with the previous match so you just instantly click ranked again at the end of your previous game this can be good in the sense that it drives you forward and you get more practice but it can also leave you hanging if you didn't resolve why you lost and you didn't make peace with that loss. And this points to something that I started weaving into Samurai Day, which is between every single match, between every two matches, I will get up from my chair, stand up, and go outside. Or I'll do some light exercise or something. So that I give myself at least a few seconds of an opportunity to think about what happened in that match. What annoyed me about that match? I can accept that something annoyed me about that match, and I can just say, fuck, I really don't like playing with 200 ping on Australia server. <sighs> and I sigh, and I let it out into the universe. It has been stated, and I've made peace with that. I still earned the loss. I made some mistakes. And then I can go into the next match fresh and ready for what's going to happen next. And I let go of those thoughts and feelings. So... If queuing into the next game right after or doing the one more thing can help you move forward, that can be a plus, but at the same time, if it's preventing you from properly digesting your losses, that's a downside. How do you find a reason to continue trying and working hard when you don't know where all this is going? 
Well, because no one knows where it all is going. All we have to work with is the best guess of what we think might happen based on what's happened in the past. And with the rapid development of technology in the world, we don't even have a clue where things are going. Where do I see myself in five years? I don't know, but I like what I do now. So focusing on streaming, entertaining, being an influencer and a leader on Twitch and trying to be the best person that I can, that's where my focus is. I can have some short and medium term goals for that, but I don't really know what's ahead. And honestly, I don't have the energy to think about all those different futures and timelines that could be in front of me. I want to focus on owning this moment as best as I possibly can. Just seeing where I am right now, seeing the energy, the focus, and the creativity that I have, and pouring that into something that is awesome that other people can enjoy. So I would say that the consistent positive feedback of the community is one of the strongest forces in keeping me going. Humans have what's called negativity bias, which is if you hear, say, 25 good comments about yourself, you're handsome, you're handsome, you're handsome, 25 times, and then a person says, you're the ugliest person I've seen. That mean comment is more likely to stick with you than all the people who said something nice. So that ends up being a bit of a tug of war of, can your supporters outweigh your haters? You do need some cognitive self-reliance. You do need some like intrinsic ability to absorb those blows, which like I said at the start of this sleep is definitely a big performance enhancer there. It's tough managing the criticism that you get. A lot of people will say that your content is stupid or cringy. They'll say that you should be doing your content in a different way. A comment that I get a bunch is that the character acting that I do is not cool or funny and I should stop that. Uh, another one is getting resistance for variety content that I make that's not StarCraft stuff. And being able to decide for myself, no, I'm going to keep doing this because I want to do this because this is an expression of who I am as a person and you can browse something else if you don't like what I'm doing here. So that's really, really, really important when you're doing something that involves community feedback and opinions is being able to take those opinions, respect them, contemplate on them, and sometimes just do the thing. Like with this Patreon topic, if people suggest a topic and they loudly vote for that topic, fuck yeah, let's go. If you think that I would be interesting to hear talk about this, I'll go for it, I'll try it. But if you're trying to make me into a fundamentally different person than the person who I perceive myself to be, I've gotta stand my ground at a point. I've gotta say, nope, we are gonna continue to do Jimothy. I know you don't like Jimothy, you just wanna see Nura all the time, that's fine. But I love playing his characters. I think it's really fun to think about a character, to think about how that character is different from you, but also how that character might have some overlap with you, and to really thrive and have fun, do a funny voice, have some different mannerisms of that character. That's a blast. And just having fun creates an aura of positive energy around you. People like being around happy people. It just brightens the mood of the room. We're social creatures and even subconsciously, we do notice and care about how other people are doing. So doing stuff that you find to be enjoyable is a very, very important thing. And one of the tricky things too is being able to decide when you don't have the energy or the focus to do something that you might consider to be a good idea. An example would be someone who is slammed with a ton of work, you have to work 10 hours a day, and you've got 67 kids and 12 dogs and a partner and you just you don't have time to ladder in starcraft and analyze your games and things like that you might be in a phase of life where you don't have a space to play a game that you might consider to be cool ah it would be cool to be masters in starcraft you might think but you have 20 minutes of game time in a whole week that's not going to be enough so being able to actualize your current situation 
and how much you can responsibly game and also which games fit within your rhythm of things that you want to do. Because some people, they work a really hard job. They're doing their nine to five or whatever time slot it is and they get home from work and they feel exhausted because it's tough. They had to put up with a bunch of shit. Maybe they had physical work to do and their body is really tired. And then to go from having a really exhausting day to loading up a video game where the opponent's objective is to tear your bases apart, it's a little bit too much. <laughs> and that's where other games can sometimes be a good option. Maybe you wanna play some WoW instead or play chess or play Hearthstone, something that's a little bit slower paced and more relaxing. That's fine. And you shouldn't feel bad because you don't have the energy for the most competitive games around. You can still watch. You can still wait until you have an opportunity. Maybe you get a week off and you want to refresh yourself and get on the ladder. Heck, and go for it. But you should forgive yourself and be compassionate to yourself for the obligations and the duties that you have as a person. You can't expect yourself to be the best StarCraft player in the world and be the parent of 67 kids and work 10 hours at a time. It's not physically possible. So you should be able to gauge your expectations according to the time and the energy that you have to commit to your hobbies. What does the ultimate neuro look like? What is the end game? That's a good question. Neuro is actually kind of like Austin, but the ideals that I strive for. It's a concept that is me, but it's me where I'm setting the goalpost at the kind of person that I'm striving to be, where I take an extra effort to be as respectful as I possibly can. And I'm also trying to be aware of my own biases, articulate those. I try to be mindful of my general mental state. I try to be uplifting and inspiring to other people. And I'm also in the spotlight with an audience, which means that I'm talking a lot more than I would in a person to person conversation. So neuro, I think the goal overall is one of influence. I didn't get into streaming because I wanted to be rich. Uh, the decisions I made for my career to switch to streaming would have been really stupid. So I was in this for bringing dialogue that wasn't there in esports. I specifically wanted to stream A Road to GM in StarCraft because I wanted people to talk about tilt and I wanted people to work on their tilt. And I feel like so far some major progress has been made. Clearly, some people have taken note and they think that these conversations are cool. I'm one of the most regular guests invited onto the Pylon show. Thank you very much for that. And a lot of people will reference stuff that I've said just in memes and things on the StarCraft subreddit. So a substantial impact has been made and that's awesome. But have we defeated all toxicity and entitlement and nastiness in online gaming in the world? No. So that broader quest is still there. The quest to challenge people to be mindful of themselves, be mindful of their actions and that impact on other people. That's Herculean. That is a huge mountain. And we have gotten some rocks to roll, but there's still a heckin' mountain there. You're struggling to do what you really like to do what you enjoy because other people expect you to do other things. You do really enjoy playing video games. It's relaxing for you. Your wife doesn't allow you to play. You're exhausted and uneasy to not do what you really like. So that's an interesting one that I think connects a little bit to the public misunderstanding of what gaming is. A lot of those people who would say, don't play video games, that's irresponsible they'll go and they'll watch a TV show right after saying that. <laughs> so if you're looking at the time invested in the TV show watching time and the video game time, they were both leisure activities, but they decided that one of them was not cool enough and that you should stop doing that. So hopefully that will continue to improve with time. I think being able to articulate the why of the importance of gaming to your partner or whoever is hassling you about that is really important. And also... Being proactive about your duties first. We say business before pleasure. 
basically, if you have, say, three things that you need to get done in your day, and you would also like to play video games, if you get the things done first, and then you play video games, you're less likely to get hassled by your housemates. Snacken's biggest reason to play games is that you're incredibly fascinated with the mechanics of them. You like to explore all the deeper mechanics and seeing the huge variety of ways people can play the games and the competitive aspects are really fun. Yes, and there are different approaches and archetypes for gamers. I'm pretty extreme in the category of people who will play a small set of games constantly and not get tired of them. I'm also someone who eats oatmeal every morning for breakfast, but StarCraft II and Classic, well, I'm good. I don't feel a strong pull to mix in a bunch of variety. And even when I play a certain game, say Dota 2, for example, is a game that I played a good bit, I didn't really feel a major drive to play all the different heroes and try a different hero every time. I would usually hone in on a set of ones that I felt fit what I wanted to do in the game and try to play those heroes to the best of my ability. So it's a set of maybe five or six out of a hundred that I'm playing a whole bunch try to get really good at. Whereas other people, they prefer the variety. Neither one of those is correct or incorrect. The one that you should choose is the one that fits your personality and your desires. What's more important, meaning or happiness? So happiness is a mood sort of thing. Meaning is an understanding sort of thing. So they're very different from each other. Happiness also doesn't necessarily mean that you would say that fulfilling things are happening. It's just a state that you're in and it can pass very quickly. An example would be happiness can be provoked whenever you get a little bit of good news and suddenly you're happy, but then you get some bad news and then you're sad. Meaning would be something that is more tangible and consistent beyond that where the meaning and purpose of what you're trying to do should be a lot more consistent and steady than your feelings about it as you go. So meaning is something that you have to decide for yourself too. And this points to the purpose for playing a certain game. Why do you play the game that you play the most? That's a question to you, viewer, listener. What is it that motivates you to play StarCraft so much? Why do you choose that game over other games? The better you can articulate that reason and that purpose, the less likely you are to throw a fit when you lose and develop a dislike of the game. Because clearly you keep coming back to it. So there's something that you like about it. And focusing on those swings of happiness and rage I think it's settled down a good bit if you understand the greater purpose of why you prioritize this game over other games. You play SC2 ladder because you enjoy the fight? Me too. And a good fight in StarCraft 2 is the most satisfying video game experience I've ever had. The only thing that is kind of similar in feeling to me is probably boxing where it involves a lot of that speed and that open-ended opportunity for how the opponent might strike at you and how you may strike back, how you might dodge or block or dip or dive or dodge, those kinds of things. But it just feels so good when you had a close game and you ended up winning. What else feels that good? There are some moments that are amazing, like on Brunt, getting a Thunder Fury and crafting that and getting help from the guild, that was amazing and really fun. But the interactions of tanking a dungeon are not quite as fulfilling and satisfying as being a GM in StarCraft. Tanking a dungeon, you're helping for other people, that's a plus. You're playing a tank, which is kind of mechanically intensive for that game, and you have to pay attention to what's around you, that's a plus too, and I enjoy doing that. But it's nowhere close to macroing six bases and defending multi-pronged drops and harassing with mutas and doing 360 surrounds and spreading creep at the same time. It's just very, very intricate and involved. So that when you win, it's amazing. When you lose, it's pretty frustrating. 
it's just a brutal and awesome game. Well, cool. We covered some questions. We talked about the physical and mental side of the psychology of gaming. We talked about the energy of the workday, putting up with shit, and how we all have limited patience per day. And we talked about sleep as the starting note of being able to charge yourself up and build up your buffer so that your quality of life and also your energy and potential success are way higher. Take care of yourselves, people. Self-care should always come first. I know you feel a lot of pressure from the outside that people think that you should do this or that or the other thing with your time. But if you are not in good condition, if your body is not well taken care of, everything is more difficult. Every interaction with other people is more stressful. It's harder to be kind and compassionate when you're stressed out. It's hard to play as fast as you can when you're super tired. So similar to the recommendation on the airplane to put the gas mask on yourself first so you can breathe the oxygen and then put it on other people, before you try to strive to give other people feedback and advice and help them out, you should also take a good hard look at how you're spending your time, how your week is organized, and maybe identify one or two weak points in your approach and try to have some baby steps in the direction to solve that problem. Taking responsibility of your experiences is difficult because much of it is unfun. And it's kind of frustrating and annoying because if you take that good hard look at yourself, you see the flaws. You see the things that are not being done as well as they could be done. You see, eh, maybe if all that stuff was better, I could be a badass or a boss. And then some people just go right into beating themselves up of, oh, I'm just a bad person, and they just kind of get defeatist. But what you should do is take a look at yourself and then say, all right, what is my next exercise that I want to do to train? Because this is your life. This is your epic montage. You are the protagonist of your life story. You are the main character. What is your character arc going to be like? How fast are your stats developing? What are you learning this year? What are you building toward? What do you have in your life that is not good for you? And how can you move away from that? You're awesome. Human beings are so intricate and amazing. All of our stories are unique. Look out for each other. Try to build up your friends. Be kind to yourself. Forgive yourself for the mistakes that you make. Try to make plans on how to not repeat those mistakes. Be mindful, be smart, be cool. And really, really don't take yourself too seriously. I know we're always looking at Instagram, looking at those big hitters and people who have amazing success stories every year. And we can get caught up in the, why am I not that good? Don't worry about it. A lot of times people are posturing more than they're actually succeeding. So just try to find something tangible that you can do to improve your day and improve your week. What do I think is the effect of my current mood with my current play style? So what? Basically, my mood is a massive factor on my success. Yesterday was a really interesting example of that because I was playing ladder standing up which adds some difficulty, but I kept winning. And I think the reason that I was winning was because I was in a happy and peaceful state of mind where the quality of my day didn't depend upon winning games. I was having fun. I was enjoying myself, having a good time. And that caused me to not doubt myself. I wasn't doubting, ah, should I go roaches or should I go bailings? I was just slapping down tech buildings. I was just slamming out drones taking bases, I don't give a crap, spam creep tumors, send some links into a base, who cares? Having that carefree kind of aspect to your games 
where you're just making a mess on the map with Zerg. Having a good time. Maybe you're a Terran, you want to blow shit up, drop some nukes. You're Protoss, you want to do some DT drops. Have a good time. If you can develop a sense of fun with the game, that is a very strong driving force to motivate you to overcome ladder anxiety, to motivate you to study the game, to learn and to grow and improve, to make friends who share your passion for the game, and to practice with you, team up with you and have a good time. Keep it real, take it easy, get some rest, stay hydrated, be mindful of your mental state before you start your practice. If you're going into it tilted, I recommend addressing the tilt first and trying to start out your session as fresh as you can, as well balanced as you can, as ready and alert as you can. If you realize that a given activity is not ideal for you, be willing to make an adjustment. Try something else that might be a better fit for yourself. There are a lot of really awesome games to choose from. Are the games that you're playing the ones that you really want to be doing? If so, full speed ahead, steady as she goes, Captain. If not, maybe think about what you want to get out of your gaming experience and how you could find a better game. Do you game too much? Maybe set a limit for yourself. Set some designated times. Or make some rule of, I want to be productive for this long and then I'll play games for that long. Do you need to be better to the other people that you game with and think about ways to edify them and give them the best possible experience that you can? Do that. I'm very thankful for all the support that I've been getting. I'm super, super grateful that I get to stream and create content and play a high-speed competitive game and talk about it as I go and be funny at the same time. This is an awesome job for me, and it's built up by you. This is a very grassroots kind of career where I'm not salaried. I don't have a boss who I applied to and said, can I have this job? And then it's agreed upon that I get this and that. You choose to subscribe every time. I don't always catch every single alert that pops off, but I am very, very grateful for that continued support. And I'm hopeful that we can continue to build and to grow and to kick ass and to share good ideas, to challenge each other to be better people over time, to have a shit ton of fun in the process as well. 2020 sucks. We're gonna build a lot of character this year. Hang in there, my friends. If you have any suggestions for other topics moving forward, Consider visiting the Patreon. You can send me a message on there. Say, yo, I've really been interested in hearing your thoughts on this topic. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a super expert in categories aside from being neuro. But even still, I think finding places for genuine conversation where you can really lay out your ideas and your thoughts and see what's up is really, really important. So thank you very much. Check out the content in the podcast the voice of neuro youtube channel has been popping off lately very thankful for all the positive comments there we get uploads basically every day the routine is good this is the first year that i've had a schedule for my stream and i'm really excited to rock out the rest of this year and see what lies ahead of us in the future and with that i think we will call this the second solo episode of The Voice of Neuro, Psychology of Gaming, Finding a Healthy Balance. GG. And thanks for tuning in.